Director of the Asia and China Programme and Senior Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, as well as that, he is non-resident senior associate of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington and was earlier a professor in Paris at the National Oriental Institute and Sciences Po. Um, and uh, he is uh, an external consultant to the uh, policy planning staff um, in France. Uh, he's going to speak to us on who is China's priority partner in the new global order? Um, a very interesting question. I've decided on what is a decidedly pragmatic and realist topic when most of the talk about China today is about China and the global order and its uh, overall vision. Uh, in fact, I've written, published at ECFR a brief on just that part, and I don't want to repeat the brief, which is one of the reasons I shifted the topic somewhat. But I'll nonetheless start from the global order. Uh, and I'll start from an analogy also. You know, I was born with Strabism because of the way I, I arrived in the world. So I'm best placed to know you can have a binocular vision if you're lucky, or you can have a monocular vision if you're unlucky, but you can't have both. You can't shift from one to the other. That's it. The question about China, the interesting illusion perhaps that we have, more so than with the US because we're very used with the US uh, being slightly diffident to aspects of the global order and you know maintaining its own sovereignty and even extending it in, in sometimes in, 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 in very harsh ways uh, uh, as we discussed over lunch in finance is that with China we regularly think of it as a country that has a global vision uh, we treat it as a potential global partner a lot of the Ch Chinese diplomatic effort, uh, given the huge staffs which they maintain with international organizations, for example, and the huge attention they give at home, including their uh, knowledge of international law, uh, which is not completely new. This is something when they were defensive in the 1920s or 30s, they also developed quite competence on international law to make up for their practical inferiority. Uh, so we have that vision uh, of a China uh, uh, that has very strong, and these are, would be the prevailing views in their foreign policy, are these views about the preferable global order. That has been given new credence by, I think you, you alluded to it, the Xi Jinping speech in Davos in early January, which some people say, by the way, was written by an American PR agency <laughs> uh, in practice. It's so well phrased. Uh, it chimes in so well with our expectations that somehow, without proof, I think that might be true. Uh, and this is, as you mentioned, clearly a moment of opportunity uh, for China in this direction. But on the other hand, China is the expert in bilateral relations uh, with almost all countries, writ large or writ small, in that aspect, it's very close to the uh, motto that uh, Xi Jinping's predecessor, Hu Tintao, introduced, the theme of the democratization of international relations, the uh, international equivalent of one man, one vote. Uh, whether a state is small or whether it's large, it deserves to be taken as seriously as we shall see. Of course, it's only part of the Chinese view, clearly. Uh, but it has been working uh, on this uh, assumption very strongly. That's where it appears, by the way, to back at least one aspect of the international order, which is the post-1945 creation of the UN and institutions of the UN. Block stuff within the UN, uh, as others have done, uh, but uh, it wants to go through that particular system which suits China. Uh, on top of that, there have been strong changes in the way foreign policy and strategy is operated after it hasn't been exactly half a century as Teng Xiaoping had predicted. It's been less than that, but I think even Teng Xiaoping could not predict the, 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 the speed of China's economic rise uh, uh, as it has happened. The, uh, what was supposed to be more or less a 50 years interval 
when China would manage to uh, bid its time and hide its talents, uh, bide its time, sorry, uh, while hiding its talent, e.g. be relatively passive and non-interventionist on global issues uh, and just you know, seize what was good for its domestic and international development, that time seems to have passed away. Uh, I have an index for that on the scholars I follow in Beijing. Uh, those scholars who were more internationalists and believers in the international order, in my view, are less representative of official views today. And the one scholar who, to me, uh, seems the closest when you want to, in a few words, just cap what is China's behavior is the very well-known professor from Tsinghua, Yan Suetong, who has been advocating alliances, who has been advocating bases. You notice that Djibouti has just been declared a base by the PLA in a new development, uh, and who has also been advocating the notion that China can reward and punish uh, its international partners, which is something that was pretty much taboo in the previous era where separation of economics with politics was much more uh, the dominant motto. So we're in a completely new period, uh, and that means that we have to pay even more attention to China's practical relations with some of its uh, partners. Uh, the answers vary also uh, a long time. Uh, if one looked again at the preceding period, one would say that what really mattered for China was the anchor in the neighborhood. That lasted also 30 years. It was partly protective, partly a way to avoid what the Chinese strategically termed encirclement or the risk of encirclement by the West. And you can see that we're in a new era where, on the contrary, the neighborhood tends to take the brunt of new Chinese power, including the coded word that we all use, assertivity. Assertivity, when we use it, uh, is a way uh, to say a thing without offending directly the Chinese or implying that there is armed conflict at the end of it. So it's a, it's a, the, the term, the code name assertivity reveals as well Western intentions and limits of Western intentions as the reality uh, itself. Uh, but to return to the question, it's clear uh, that the neighborhood has taken a hit. If I had done that expose 20 years ago, it would have tempted to say that Japan was actually the main partner of China for economic reasons. Uh, uh, and, and Japan, indeed, uh, for a very long time, had a huge importance uh, for Chinese development. That's no longer the case for a number of reasons, which are not only political or strategic, uh, and therefore, we can almost dismiss Asia, except, of course, that China's attitudes may cause Asia to gang up and try to resist the Chinese. Again, there is a coded word for that. It's hedging, not resisting. Uh, we are careful, or they are careful, with the way they express themselves. And in itself, it also shows an ambivalence to China, but a reluctance to uh, go to conflict. And that's, of course, an interesting factor. The only problem that exists with this is that when one party becomes sure that the other is really reluctant to go into conflict, that of course bolsters its tactical opportunities since it's pretty sure uh, that it's going to be still going to be able to avoid conflict. That is a lesson I heard from Russian friends talking about President Obama in retrospect shaking their heads and saying, well, he was just too predictable. Uh, that's what neighboring Asia to a large extent has become. So we are left with the other partners and without going through the whole list, obviously the candidates are the US as always, Russia as a reappearing or mutual support club for China, and optimistically the EU uh, which does capture uh, a lot of the economic uh, relationship, uh, but cannot pretend, of course, to be a strategic partner. So in a way, this is a foregone conclusion, but since we're Europeans, I will end up uh, with some European 
perspective. Let's start by the US and what strikes me looking at the expert community in China in as much as it's ready to talk, uh, in looking at official pronouncements or press pronouncements, is how different their expressions about the current US administration and from the president himself are from ours. We're full of irony, we're full of skepticism, we're full of doom and gloom predictions about what this will all entail. The Chinese are careful, fairly respectful, uh, attentive. Uh, it is extraordinary with all the opportunity that the president himself offers that almost literally nothing has been taken up by the Chinese press except in very general terms uh, or in uh, trying to point out to commonalities with others vis-a-vis -vis America. Uh, it is uh, very striking and it may be an illusion. I have thought for, a long, for, for the last six months that it was an illusion, but we shall see that on the contrary, there has been a conservative realist analysis probably going to the fore in China saying Trump is a realist, he's a pragmatist, he's a businessman, he wants to deal, he could be our man. In spite of the overall extraordinary campaign from the right-wing Republicans on both the uh, strategic dangers that China poses and the even more important campaign to the Chinese on economic and trade issues because this is the bread and butter of China's economy, the export uh, and the maintenance of, of free markets on the other side of the fence, if I, if I, if, if, if I, if I dare to say. Uh, so that contrast is quite impressive, uh, is something that we take on because either we are mistaken or they are, but uh, we can't all be right. In practice, this has means that there has been underreaction uh, to the Trump's, Trump administration's early pronouncements. The tweets uh, on Taiwan uh, and on one China policy were really the worst possible thing that could happen to the official Chinese diplomatic community, uh, but I managed to treat it in a very underhanded uh, way. Uh, their reactions uh, on the ground, so to speak, were extremely moderate. Uh, up to very recently, up to just the last two weeks, one could cite uh, before President Obama left office a skirmish near the Philippines uh, with a submarine drone, an American submarine drone captured uh, by the Chinese and Trump's remarkable comment, let them have it, uh, which could work both ways, you know. Uh, but on the whole, uh, things moderated in the South China Sea. Uh, the Chinese uh, did not press on uh, for quite a number of months. They, on a skirmish, on a semi-permanent skirmish with the Philippines uh, decided that they would suddenly open the contested area that's inside, a bit technical, inside Scarborough Shoal to uh, fishermen from other nations. Very ambiguous position because they both, in this case, uh, uh, implement what is clearly an international request that this is open ground for all, but at the same time, since they are the policemen, the enforcers who can say yes or can say no, they do assert sovereignty in the same breath. But still, uh, what I would call an interval, a moment of pause. Uh, and uh, they've watched Donald Trump. They've noticed the backtracking on Taiwan. Uh, they've noticed the new uh, accent on North Korea uh, and the trade-off with trade. And the extraordinary thing is they've essentially dealt with President Trump as they were dealing with President Obama, which is giving surface uh, acquiescence. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do, we'll make efforts. Uh, and I, I, I almost want to say, as usual, not delivering. Uh, instead, trying to uh, gain others, including Europeans, by the way, uh, in the direction of further engagement with North Korea as an alternative uh, to sanctions. Uh, 
the results are demonstrated on the ground, and in fact, North Korea, as you know, has a higher rate of growth currently than it has had for the past decade, uh, this with a supposedly tight sanctions regime uh, along its neck. Uh, so probably they knew it wouldn't last forever. Uh, in the trade-off about trade, they have been watching. Uh, and this is where I'm going to shift immediately to Europe as a party. It would have seemed intuitive that if you have a major trading problem looming ahead with the US and a US president who tends to shoot from the hip and, and to fire in various directions, including in the direction of Europeans from time to time, especially about Germany, you would sort of sneak up to the Europeans, arrange some deals, move forward, try and, so to speak, buy insurance that there is not going to be a joint front on trade. That's if you think uh, that uh, you really need to be strategic about it. What I see of the past few months is after an initial trend, which everybody in Brussels, by the way, describes as having existed, of you know, more positive speech, getting closer to talks, uh, 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 exploring good intentions to move forward on the investment treaty, for example, essentially shutting up about uh, Europe's very daring stand not to enforce market economy status, but to stick with the previous restrictions and in a way to, 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 to move away from the path that WTO planned 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, the trend happened for some time, but I think since early 2017, it dissipated immediately. And at the summit uh, recently, uh, after some visible hesitations and contradictions among the Chinese themselves, including the delegation, which, which which sort of raises also the issue of factions or camps or authority within the Chinese system at this point on these issues, and in particular to me, the question of the prime minister. Uh, the prime minister's actual standing is open, uh, but he may have you know, also let himself be used as a kind of stooge moving forward in the direction of Europeans and then moving back or letting himself be moved back visibly. There's no concession at all. Uh, None. So no possibility of agreement. Very slim chances of moving forward on uh, the investment treaty in spite of the good intentions that had been portrayed earlier in the year. And to me, moving back to the global order, the refusal of the Chinese to stand together with Europeans on the climate issue, which would have been, of course, to sop to Donald Trump and to his recent positions on climate, well, they turned it down. They turned down an opportunity to make remarkable, good, soft power propaganda about themselves, which they would undoubtedly have gathered, and we would be seeing many more op-eds about China's leadership of climate issues if they had signed that. But try to think for a second what went on through their head or what went on through the head of the top leader. Can I afford to insult Donald Trump? publicly, internationally, by siding up with people who are supposed to be American allies against the US, or will I reserve my fire, so to speak, uh, and maintain what is the primary negotiating issue I have, which is dealing with the United States? And to me, it's very clear that for the time being, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping chose the second uh, option, not the first. And he sacrificed, in spite of the January Davos speech, in spite of all the mileage that China would get, he sacrificed the first issue for the second, which uh, is interesting and could mean two things, among which I cannot choose at all. One option is that he really fears the US, that China really has a fear of the very serious protectionist uh, measures uh, that the US under the Trump administration uh, might take. Uh, and there are signs of that, after all, you know, use, uh, uh, aggravated use of Section 232 uh, of, of the uh, uh, Trading Act, uh, Foreign Trading Act in the US, uh, that is using national security as, a, as an excuse for uh, 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 trade sanctions, trade, or trade denial or investment denial. Uh, another uh, 
uh, measures. The other uh, possibility is that he thinks that he'll deal, that the US will deal, that the uh, resolve of the US will fade, and that China just has to keep a steady head, not insult the US, and wait for natural events to run their course. That would be the uh, hypothesis of US decline brought on by itself, by political events and political trends inside the US, and the least you do about it. The Putin example is a good example that if you meddle with it, you actually uh, hurt yourself instead of help yourself. Just let it go its course. That's entirely possible. Uh, because China has become quite sophisticated about American politics, and Chinese diplomats are also very sophisticated about American politics. Conclusion of that uh, first uh, theme, and I have to stop very soon, uh, is that U.S. retains primacy, uh, even now, and even as we tend to write, my colleagues at ECFR want to write about the post-American world and so on, I, I sort of fight them because I think you can't reduce a country to one president, especially in a democracy, uh, but that's the way it is. Russia, very quickly. Of course, the best description that has been made was made by Bobo Lowe a few years ago, the axis of convenience. Uh, although he himself admits he's written a rather convoluted piece in Australia more recently, uh, which I'll say, yeah, we're moving a little beyond that. There is more strategic connivence, but still, and yes, not hard to document the mutual mistrust, not hard to document that China has taken advantage of uh, Russia's de need with the European sanction and American sanction policy by essentially making oil and gas agreements on the cheap, getting, I mean, signing a 50 years deal on oil uh, at future spot, or gas at future spot prices was a brilliant idea even the way spot prices have been going. And it's so brilliant that there is not even enough money probably to finance the whole, uh, the whole scheme uh, inside Russia now. It's almost too brilliant. Uh, uh, it got the weapons, uh, weapon systems, which Putin had been very uh, skeptical about. Don't forget that Putin is the guy uh, who purged because Khodorkovsky was the guy who was making the deal with China and, and Putin put the policy back towards the deal with Japan as well, that is playing a level balance. He had a clear mind on that. And, 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 and suddenly, of course, the, the pendulum swung again in favor uh, of China. But my description for it is not even the axis of convenience. It's, it's, it's mutual support when it suits Russia and China, one problem Russia has is that its positions, its international positions are systematic. So it probably seeks support more often than China does, which puts it again in the uh, uh, demanding, in the camp of those who, who, who request rather than those who deliver. And for China, spotty agreement with the Russians uh, with a view to signal to the West through these agreements, its displeasure on something. I look at Syria, UN votes on Syria, where Russia has been extremely consistent uh, in its vetoes, and I note that China's track record is a little more patchy, and you can identify, for example, over the past years, over the past year, moments when China has no big underlying conflict uh, with, 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 with American or European views, and it abstains, or the beginning of the uh, testy period uh, this year with Trump's remarks on Taiwan and, and other stuff, where suddenly China is able to join Russia to veto humanitarian intervention, of all things, into Syria. It takes a hard line position. But my take about this is that the votes are hardly about Syria, beyond a preference for governments in place and so forth. Uh, they are much more a, a way to signal to the West displeasure. Fascinatingly, in the past few weeks, the Chinese participation in, with two Russian maneuvers in the Baltic with quite modern ships. Uh, this is, of course, a quid pro quo for Russian participation uh, to maneuvers, or they're not even joint maneuvers. They're sort of one following the other, for example, in the straits ar around Sankaku. Uh, 
uh, the Ariyu facing uh, the Japanese, uh, a kind of halfway uh, Russian support and participation. It deserves some payback. Uh, but it's also, and, and, and I find it almost hilarious that this happens one month or two months after Mr. Xi Jinping went to Finland and celebrated with Finland the 100th, the 100th anniversary of Finnish independence, uh, which the, you know, the Finnish take stock in that support and think it's serious, but there you are. Uh, the contradiction is there only two months uh, later. But in my view, they don't do that to make fun of the Finns or, to, uh, or because they would have uh, mixed views. Uh, they do this because they know the chips are about to fall down on Korea, that we're getting at the end of the uh, patience uh, period for, for China to implement sanctions, that uh, some kind of polemics and conflict is inevitable, and they begin to show their teeth. So one day, for the first time in many months, jet fighters intercept uh, American EP-3, and they don't do it over the South China Sea, they do it off the Korean coast, which is very interesting. Uh, and almost in the same amount of time, suddenly uh, they show the flag uh, and very strongly in the Baltic together with Russia saying, if you want to create enemies, well, we're ready to become enemies. That's a very open and flexible diplomacy. Uh, it's one that's getting ready to stand up to the US, uh, but it doesn't make Russia the top priority uh, in Chinese policy. Uh, the remaining problem for Mr. Putin is that three quarters of his interests are with the West, especially with Europe economically, that the sanctions hit, that China is no substitute economically uh, for this kind of thing, and that yes, he gets the occasional uh, life support and he gets uh, some degree of international legitimacy by not being alone. By the way, he's very careful, but he phrases things about the South China Sea. The Russians are not giving blanket approval to the Chinese. They also understand they might want to move back, but they have to understand they are not a priority. 